You're listening to In Cap We Trust for the Always Next Year Podcast Studio Network. You can find the team on our Twitter at ANY Podcast or on our website, www.alwaysnextyearpodcast.com. And now, to bring us in, the Jack Dolls. That son of a bitch again. He cracked open a rib or two. He beat me so they threw and through. And so she over my unconscious frame. I won me healthy sheriff fights. Well, lucky son still have me life since Mickey Flynn beat me dumb and lame. Hello and welcome to. The best version since the Bryce Harper podcast version of In Cap We Trust. Here at the Always Next Year podcast, I am your ecstatic host, Shane, and I am joined by my probably more ecstatic co-host, Rob. How are you, sir? I've been behind the Fire Mally, the hashtag Fire Mally thing for a long time, (laughs) and it finally happened. The team listened to me. They went on Twitter. They saw the hashtag Fire Mally probably trending somewhere. I started it. Actually, I think somebody... (laughs) When he is with the Cubs, started it, but I made it popular here in Philadelphia, and we're grateful and for it. They listened to the hashtag. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. So, first of all, Jim Salisbury had kind of alluded to after the the finalization of that West Coast trip with the off day coming that he sensed changes were going to be on the horizon. It's pretty much what happens after that kind of a stretch. Now. I don't think that I trust the organization to do this. Did you trust that the organization was at any point this year after basically coming out and stating everyone's safe three months ago? No, I didn't trust that they were going to do it. I thought that they were going to at least hang on to Kapler until the end of the season, which they still may, but I thought that the hitting coach and pitching coach, that decision would have been more under Kapler's jurisdiction and therefore would have remained the same at least until the end of the season. Yeah, uh, the, the Phillies kind of, I guess, made more of an executive move, and it was the executive yes. move. You know, it, it. So I watched the presser. I know you didn't. And one thing was certain was that Kapler was just again. He's just in there to to be the guy to kind of lead and manage the decisions of those who pay him. Middleton, Clentock, McPhail. You know, the three of them sitting there and, and kind of just giving him the tools to succeed or fail, as he has done this year. Clintac looked so uncomfortable it was not even funny, which was brilliant to me. Also annoying to watch because he is such an ass. Uh, we'll get on that in a little bit. But this is clearly a, a John Middleton move. Uh, and we'll talk about you know some of the ways that, that I kind of took this whole press conference. Um, but let's start with the first thing here. And this is like a, a minor pet peeve of me. If you're firing someone who has sucked that bad at what they do, and you've relied so heavily on them to to lead what you poured half a billion freaking dollars into in the offseason to go alongside with some really good homegrown or talented homegrown names. Why does John Malley get the headline relieved of his duties? Why can't we say we shot his ass to the sun and we're moving on to a better time? Political correctness, man. It's absurd. it It is absurd. If I was that bad at my job, as Mally was here, if I was that disconnected from the people that I was supposed to be, in theory, supervising, and I had to be, quote-unquote, relieved of my duties, I would hope someone lashed out to the media about my ineffectiveness. Screw that guy. I yeah. hate 2019. I hate political correctness. I want to be offensive to everyone. First of all, no one should get offended by everything. I hate social media. I think that's the entire reason people get fucking offended by it's definitely everything. definitely the driving force behind it, that's for sure. It's absurd. Everyone's got a voice and no one should fucking have one. We shouldn't be able to do this show right now. Let's be serious. <laughs> it's absurd. Um, but that one, that, that drove me crazy. I, I hate the, the elegance behind relieved of his duties. Like, it's just so, they're there. We think that you'll do okay somewhere else, which was mentioned in that presser. We think we'll do, he'll be a very good hitting coach somewhere else. Like, I don't know who the fuck wants to hire this guy again. I would just straight um, up say that he was canned. I don't care if I'm using slang in an official statement. I just say the Phillies have canned John (laughs) Nelly. Who cares? Just something to, to, I I don't know, fit the mood of the city and your fan base and, and the frustrations of the organization. Like, if anything, I wish John Middleton was just like, 
I'm going to go on Twitter today. <laughs> I'm just going to go on a huge rant that ends with, fuck John Malley. That would have been gold to On me. Some, uh, some Donald Trump shit there. That's what I'm saying. Like, <laughs> well, maybe the same people will manage uh, Donald Trump's Twitter and John Middleton's Twitter, which would be brilliant. It would be awesome. Uh, yeah, that would offend the world. <laughs> um, all right, so let's get into to one of the most interesting things that, that we kind of talked about in our group chat uh, with AMYP and all the writers and the NCAP we trust guys. What this kind of means for Gabe Kapler. Now, my stance is, is kind of... This was a move made purely for the fans. It's short term, as what uh, Matt Klintek kind of alluded to in that presser, stating this is a seventh week assignment. This is not long term. You know, this is this is to get us over the hump. So, before I had seen the presser, that was kind of my takeaway: it was this city and this fan base fucking hates you. So, what better way to win back some people than bring back the most popular figure from a managerial standpoint in Philly's history? That's that's the move. That's bringing some people back. That's getting some people a little more excited. But what does that mean for Gabe Kapler now? To me, it doesn't mean a whole lot for Kapler. Uh, I don't see Charlie Manuel as being, you know, the kind of guy who could... He's, he's an interim hitting coach. That's all he is. He's not going to come back and manage the team at any point. So I don't see this being a threatening move to Kapler in any way. I think that... Kapler still has his fate in his own hands the way he manages out the rest of the season. I think that if they keep playing the way that they've been playing of late, or if they dip below 500, or if they finish the season, you know, behind the Mets, then Kapler's not going to be back anyway, regardless of, you know, what, what he says and what he does. But, like I said, it's in his own hands. If they go, if they get hot, if they somehow sneak into the wild card spot, if they finish, you know, maybe third place in the division above 500 ahead of the Mets, I think that at the very least he's going to get consideration to return next year. So Corey Simon had put out an article. It's, it's a great article. It's on um, NBC, uh, NBC Sports Philadelphia. Uh, and so these are just a, a two-paragraph excerpt from it. While Kapler kept his job this week, he is now in a no-win situation, which is what the title is, uh, of the article essentially is, Kapler now in a no-win situation. Because if the Phillies do make a turnaround, a lot of the credit will go to Manuel for providing that spark. And if the Phillies continue to lose, much of that blame will then be placed at Kapler's feet. It's not, an ideal, uh, it's not ideal for a polarizing manager who has yet to solidify himself in town as a tough Philadelphia, or in a town, man, I really got to get glasses, this is absurd. Uh, in a town as tough as Philadelphia to have the most beloved manager in team history lurking over your shoulder. So uh, excuse the fact that I am an adult who cannot read out loud uh, and the fact that I also do not have glasses with me for the last three times we've done this segment. Um, but it's interesting. You know, it, it is difficult. Now, I do think that if there is a manager in today's game that won't necessarily feel that pressure, I do think it's Gabe. Um I don't know if you listened to Angelo this morning on WIP, which I do not listen to this anymore. Uh, however, one of uh, one of the guys I follow on Twitter had posted the link to his interview this morning with Kapler, and Kapler seemed very on on board with the Charlie uh, Charlie acquis- not acquisition Charlie bringing him back and stating that no, there isn't pressure. Everyone understands when you take a job as a manager in professional sports or, or coach uh, in professional sports, it's to get fired. Eventually, you will get fired. Very few people are like Bochi who are just going to say, huh, I'm done, and walk away. So he understands that. So I don't think that he's going to feel any more or less pressure with Charlie in the room than when he wasn't in the room. So I do think that's super interesting. He's got a point there. I mean, even Charlie himself got fired. Sure. And Charlie brought us one of the two World Series championships that we have in like 130 some odd years or whatever mm-hmm. it is. Dumbest is organization the, in the history of baseball. Yeah, the best the best manager that we've ever had and even he got canned. Yep. So um, he he does have a point there. Like you see great coaches get fired all the time. There's very few that make it through their whole career and then walk out on their own terms. And I think that's I think it's super hard to to listen to one voice all the time like that i think college sports are kind of the exception you know because that talent is a constant turnover sometimes one year to the next in football three four years to the next like that voice doesn't necessarily get stale in professional sports when you have guys signing 13-year contracts somewhere 
If you got to listen to one voice for 13 years and it hasn't really worked after year two, three, four, five, whatever year it ends up being, eventually you got to make a decision. No matter how talented of a manager that that person is, they're going to have to go take that voice elsewhere. It's best for that individual manager and it's best for that organization. Charlie, voice got stale. That's what it was. Uh, you know, they, they needed some kind of shakeup and that's the direction they went in. Um, one part of that, while on Charlie getting fired in 2013, his last game manager is going, going to be to the day. Uh, to, so when he returns tonight, it will be the day that he was fired uh, six years ago, seven years ago, whenever it was. It's crazy how that stuff works Which is out. interesting. Um, but leave it to Howard freaking Eskin. Did you see this? I didn't see anything that... I've been out of the loop for the past couple of days. I haven't seen anything. Okay, that so this is brilliant. Done. Um, so obviously here, we, we've kind of torched Eskin on numerous occasions. Um, so I've never seen someone so uncomfortable or pretending to be uncomfortable as Howard Eskin was during that presser. So Howard Eskin at one point, everyone else is asking fairly relevant questions, things of the sort. Leave it to this dickhole to sit here and ask Gabe Kapler about a tweet that he had in 2013, two weeks prior to Charlie Manuel being relieved of his duties from manager of the Philadelphia Phillies, where he had stated that you have to do the difficult thing, Understand that the fans are going to be upset. The team's going to be upset. It's going to be hard for everyone, but it's time. It's time to move on from Charlie. And now he's going to be working, or Charlie's going to be working for Gabe Kapler, the author of that then tweet when he was a Fox analyst. Why Why ask this? I don't know. What a jackass. You know what? I did hear that even Miss Nelly roasted him for it. I don't listen to Miss Nelly. Everyone I saw it on, on social media. Even that goofball Miss Nelly. He's just <laughs> as bad as Eskin. Maybe, I, th- I honestly think even worse than Eskin. Was he's so full of it. himself. Both of them, really. Um, but yeah, Missy, for, for sure. Yeah, they're both goofballs. So listen to us instead. We're a lot better. <laughs> and also totally not politically correct. I just used the word <laughs> dickhole in a segment. Um, but... Uh, yeah, it's it's bizarre. You know, I sit here and so many people around the room are asking super relevant questions. Bega Montero, I think is her name, uh, from The Athletic, is ask, asking great questions. Um, Salisbury always asks great questions. You have all these, like, really informative things, and they're challenging them to answer the necessary bits of information that we need. Why was this decision being made now? Did the West Coast swing have anything to do with it? Is it the fact that the offense has... Here are the numbers. This is another Simon bit here. Uh, this came out uh, like two, three days ago. This is the Phillies post-offensive uh, or post-All-Star break offensive numbers. 26th in run scored, 27th in batting average, 26th in slugging percentage, 25th in OPS, and 26th in extra base hits. Then you have people like Reese Hoskins, who over his last 100 and... Or, 80 some plate appearances, whatever it's been, out of 197 people. He ranks 197th in three different categories. That's according to Johnny Heller. He's like two for his last 40, two for his last 41, something like that. His batting average is down, I think, into the 230s now. I don't know where it's at, but it can't be good. Um, But, uh, you know, all these people are asking those types of questions. Is this the reason for it? And then asking that weenie goes out there and, and. Digs up a, a tweet from 2000. This man should be working for TMZ or some shit. Like, he is such an ass. God, I hate that guy. Yeah, it's not surprising. <clears throat> that's that's very typical of, of asking. He's that kind of guy. He is. He's just, again, total dickhole. Uh, so let's talk some of the presser. Now, I watched it. You didn't. So I'm curious to see what, what your reactions will be to some of the different things that I had kind of noticed. First of all, you've heard... Clintech speak a numerous uh, or a number of times. You've heard him speak on positive things. You've heard him speak on negative things whilst apparently not being negative in his responses. Is there a worse human being on the planet to listen to than Matt Clintech? He's, he's really frustrating to listen to because every time I hear him speak, he sounds like a guy who knows nothing about baseball <laughs> and only knows about numbers. He, he literally he comes across as someone who knows nothing about the actual sport and, you know, the the factors that make it, that go into making players play well and putting a good team together and all that stuff. He literally only knows about numbers. And that's that that just drives me nuts every single time I hear him speak. I just feel like there's such a disconnect between him and, and 
all of reality, honestly. But listening, he's the worst actual speaker I've ever heard, like in my entire life. This is coming from guys who are doing podcasts who should not be speaking. Like we should not be talking to humans. And here we are. And I'm pretty certain people would rather listen to either one of us speak and issue a thought than listen to that ass clown out there trying to do something. He it's as though nothing computes in his brain and then finds its way down and travels through those neurons to his mouth and and says the actual words that people need to hear. It, something misfires there. He is some sort of malfunction. He's a fucking idiot. I don't understand how, how anyone can look at this guy and say, I'm comfortable with him leading this, this organization right now. I'm comfortable with him making executive franchise altering moves and decisions. He's leading a good front office right now. Get the hell out of here. Him and McPhail both need to fucking go. It's it's embarrassing is, is what it is. But McPhail um, is such an appropriate last name for the job he's done here. Yeah, I've seen all the all the different things coming up, McFailure and, and things of the sort. Um this, Jack and James on, on High uh, High Hopes Pod, you know, they sit there and say constantly, you know, how how you can place your trust in a guy who hasn't been relevant in 30 years in, in terms of what he does, how the fuck can the Phillies find that to be a, a solid decision in 2019? And then furthermore, how, the, how can they find a minor market GM such as Klintak, who doesn't know what it's like to, to be a big boy with money? How can you place your trust in these two people? It's a complete identity crisis as to what this organization has the ability to do it's it's truly baffling. I mean, with McPhail, you're talking about the Phillies supposedly having confidence in him because he, you know, he built the Orioles into like a fringe playoff team for what, like two or three years? Yeah. And now look at them; they're fucking garbage. Now. <laughs> they're they have, not a major league team. Yeah, they're only only the uh, Tigers have a worse record than them right now. Which, by the way, that's where text you sent us last night about the Tigers is unreal. Yeah, I did not realize that's that. That's fucking brutal. That's a. Uh, that is quite a bad and team. And to make matters even worse, we had trouble beating them the two games that we were out there. We did. What did we score? A total of like three runs? Something I can't like remember. That, yeah. But yeah, and then Klintak, you have the guy who was, what was he, the assistant GM out in L.A.? Mm-hmm. Uh, but the L.A. Angels. B team. Yeah. yeah the, uh, the small market, the Angels out there, who only spend money on Mike Trout and nothing else, and Pools. So, yeah, you have two guys who, I mean, Baltimore's not a big market, Angels aren't a big market. Philadelphia is a big market. And it's a totally different ball game when you come to a big market team because that means you have to be willing to spend a lot more money. You have to, I think in a big market, you have to try to avoid a rebuild as much as you possibly can because you want to remain relevant with the the other three teams in town. So that's that's one thing that you got to focus on. And it's just a completely different ball game between, you know, playing in a small market where maybe the fans don't really care as much and in Philadelphia, a big market where the fans are, you know, diehards here. Yeah, for sure. And you mentioned a good uh, a good point about rebuilds. You know, this quickest rebuild in the history of rebuilds is the slowest thing I've ever seen in my entire entire existence. I don't understand how during a process in which you rebuild, you have next to no major league capable talent to show for it. You have a handful of people there. You know, you have your Scott Kingery, you have your Reese Hoskins and Aaron Nola. Um, that that's it. Like that's truly it. And then in the system, you know, you have Hazley, who has shown flashes so far. I've been very impressed with him at the major league level, especially considering he was kind of rushed. I, I don't really know that age matters so much anymore in baseball. Um, you know, as we're seeing, you know, superstar players just getting younger and younger. They're nineteen, twenty, twenty-one years old, and uh, Hazley was a three-year college guy and a couple of years in the minors for us. So you know, he's twenty-three, twenty-four. Um, I could think that a couple of years in college kind of makes up for a couple of years in the minors, though. You would think you know, it. It was so far in that thought before. I, I don't think it is so much anymore. So, but you know, again, it, it, it's speaking to the talent that we don't have here. We do not have. Take a look at every single team in our division. Everyone has young talent that is super electrically exciting, and we have Reese Hoskins, who I don't, I don't know. I put out a tweet that you know that said maybe this is just what he is. I felt like LJ typing that tweet. I just felt like like the bad news bunny. Someone get me some fucking honey. I don't remember what the hell that's from, but that is a funny ass quote. I'm not gonna um, lie. I, had, I had kind of <laughs> the same thought. If maybe if the Phillies can 
you know, upgrade at first base. They got to look into doing it during the off season. I still want to have faith in Reese that he can improve, that he can become that forty homer, you know, two sixty so, guy. Here's a hypothetical because I, I too, sit here and think, well, he still has another year of team control or two years of team control, whatever it is. Um, would you make Reese kind of a headliner, a major league headliner, to get a top of the line rotation? You know, piece uh, you're gonna have to package him with other things. Move Bohm to first base because he, honestly, long term probably is not a third baseman. No matter how much people state you know state that he is, every other organization in baseball, which we are the dumbest organization in baseball, so I trust the other twenty some organ twenty nine organizations more than I trust the freaking Phillies. But would you make that move and then try to completely overpay for Anthony Rendon and make him your third baseman? Absolutely, because hey, at least Rendon is a proven player. Yeah. Rendon's a guy who goes out and he hits 300 every year. He hits 30, 35 home runs every year. I mean, the, the power output, maybe the RBIs are going to be similar to Reese, but he's got a higher average, a higher on-base percentage. That's that's a monumental improvement there. And plus, he's a good defensive third baseman. Mm-hmm. And then if you put Bohm at, at first base, I think Bohm's going to end up being maybe not as much of a power guy, but a, a more well-rounded hitter than Reese will be. Yeah, and look, they've... They've certainly unlocked something with Bohm to, to this point with his power this year. Um, he's having a spectacular power run right now in uh, in Double A. Um, but so let's touch on a few more things from from this presser. So again, this was clearly a Middleton decision, and Clentac was very very uncomfortable. Now, just curious. Now I was angry, like brutally angry whilst watching this. Had to pause it numerous times while watching alone at home. Uh, again, I watched the replay of this. Um, and I'm sitting here and I'm pausing this. And Klintek at one point goes, listen, there's 44 games left. There's plenty of time to make a run. We have enough talent. Essentially, paraphrasing all of these points, of course. 44 games left, and he has confidence that they can make a run. And he waited until now, after the Mets went surging, after the, the Nationals are a significantly better baseball team than you and the Braves are far and away the best in the division, now at 44 games, you are confident that you're in a position to make a wild card. How does that make you feel? I mean, on one hand, I do agree with them that the team has the talent alone, at least offensively, to make a run. But, yeah, it's, it's too late in the season to be talking about that. It's just, he, he should have realized before the trade deadline, that there are holes that needed to be filled, especially in the starting rotation. And he goes out and he gets Drew Smiley and Jason Vargas. Now, mind you, Jason Vargas has pitched pretty well. And so is Smiley since he came over. Vargas actually, what, what was his uh, stat line last night? It was like six, six innings. Six innings, two runs, five hits maybe. He, he's, he's done a good job since he came over, but he's not the big splash that they needed. They could have gone out and maybe made a package for Stroman, who, by the way, ended up with those red-hot Mets. Mm-hmm. They could have gone out and made a move for Baumgartner. They could have, earlier in the season, made a move for Keuchel, who's pitched pretty well for the Braves since he went down there. And they, they all they needed to do was sign him. They didn't need to trade anybody for Keuchel. Yeah, the Keuchel experience, again, I, I was adamantly against the Keuchel thing for a long time, and then when I saw the mass failures of our rotation, I was like, just fucking get anybody. Like, literally anyone. Put another major league arm in there. Keuchel has not been good this year. Um, you know, he, he has certainly not been, I think, any more or less of a problem or a help figure than what anyone we put in our rotation right now. Has he really? I thought he had a pretty decent uh, stat line with the Braves. Not particularly. No, he's, um, I think, I saw a tweet. I think his ERA is um, either nearing five or over five now. Um, I've been missing out then. So, yeah, I can't, I think it was like 487, some, somewhere in that range. Um, but uh, with a whip that was not awesome either. So I think it was near one and a half. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, I mean, they needed to make upgrades. And to say that that's still on the table right now, you're, you're, like I know, theoretically, like numbers wise, we're, we're not mathematically out of it. In fact, we're mathematically still very much so in the conversation. Being is that we're only what a game and a half, two games out of that second wild card spot. But then he goes on to say, you know, if we find a way to get into the second wild card spot, you know, we're exactly where we want to be. Let me rephrase in my Costanzonian type of letter or rhetoric: we are exactly, exactly where we want to be. 
When they signed Bryce Harper, traded for JT Realmuto, and sent over Sixto Sanchez, who, by the way, looks fucking unreal right now in Miami. Uh, well, in their farm system, I should say. When they went out and make the trade for Gene Segura, when they clear up first base for Reese Hoskins again, exactly where you want to be, the second wild card spot, the one game play in for the playoffs that no one really honestly gives a shit about. It's the worst fucking thing in sports I've ever seen. That's embarrassing. Exactly where you want to be? You are such an ass. I hate, hate Matt Klintak. How tone deaf can that guy be? This is not exactly where they wanted to be when they envisioned this season. Where are his standards? I don't know. Are his, is, is that acceptable to him to go out and spend $500 million in the offseason and then be fighting for the second wildcard spot? I mean, when we started the season, I, for, I forget exactly what you predicted. I projected this team to be somewhere between 90 and 95 wins. You said 94 or 95. L said 88, I want to say. I said 91. And I don't remember what Steve said. So at the... We're looking at, like, right now, a ceiling of maybe 84, 85 wins. Mm-hmm. So, at the very at the very most, they're probably going to come up about 10 wins short of my projection, about, you know, six or seven short of everybody else's. Yep. That's not acceptable. And I, I, I'm not the only one who projected them to win 95 games this year. I know a lot of people out there who projected them to be in the, the low to mid-90s, that range. Yeah, certainly, certainly not. This season has gone, and there's a myriad of different reasons. You know, I'm not going to sit here and say that it's any one thing. We would be obtuse to think that. Um, it's been a lot, and the tone that comes from Klintak anytime he speaks and the tone that comes from McPhail and the rare opportunities that he has to speak, I don't know what they're watching. I don't know who they think they're talking to, but it's, they're not meant for Philadelphia. If you want to talk that way, you're not meant for a city like this. You will get torched, and they are being torched every time they make an appearance. Now, we started this thing happy, so let's roll back into some of the excitement here. Yeah, and I thought that was the goal here. This is the, this is the goal. I am still super excited to, you know, to sit here and talk Charlie Manuel, even though, again, short term, and this is basically for the fans. Um, but for us to talk about for the Phillies, for the hitters there. This is exciting. You have one of you have a guy who whose biggest passion I think in life is hitting a baseball as hard and as far as you fucking can. It's hit in season. It's hit in season. And that's exactly what it is. So we're going through one thing that was interesting from the presser as well is the fact that Gabe acknowledged that no player is the same and there are players who want all of the information. There are players that want none of the information. There's, you know, but at the end of the day, it all comes down to: can we give them that swagger back when they walk back into the box, and can they be confident? And that is hands down one thing that Charlie has always, always been great at: is bringing another level of confidence and self assuredness to these players, to his hitters. You sit there and you, you take a look. He, he had the best year. I mean, obviously, you know, he had them during their core and prime years. But when you look at Howard, when you look at Utley, when you look at Jimmy, you know. Chase Utley didn't necessarily have a power stroke. He just had a really clean swing, and Charlie maximized that. Still managed to hit 30, 35 34 home runs, runs that one year. Um, you know, Jimmy Rollins, another guy. Now, we all got on him about trying to swing for the fences all the time, but he he was New Age Baseball before New Age Baseball was a thing. He was 250, 260. He did draw a lot of walks. He made damage pitches or made you pay with, with bad pitches uh, You know, in the zone. That was kind of Charlie, you know, and putting him in a in a clubhouse right now that identity in the box and philosophy wise in the box, they seem so fucking lost. This is going to be huge. I don't think Charlie's going to walk in there and say, hey, your hands are at the wrong spot. Hey, your hips are firing too early. You're drifting, you're casting, whatever you want to say. I don't think he's going to walk in and say those types of things. I think he's going to give the, the kind of sentiment that just says, hey, you you're a major league hitter. You know what you've been. If you're talking to, to Bryce Harper, if you're talking to Reese Hoskins, you know what you have the ability to do. You've got to find the, the, the sense of attack in your approach again. You know They've fallen in love with this see-as-many-pitches-as-you-can approach and not taking the damage on, on early strikes in the count that, that are right there. And I think Charlie's going to say, hey, when you see it, fucking swing as hard as you can. And that's kind of baseball right now. So Kapler today on his, uh, his spot on WIP again with uh, with Angelo Cataldi, 
you know, he mentioned, he's like, no matter what you want to call it, you know, it's whether it's launch angle, whether it's barreling it up, whether it's hitting the sweet spot, um, you know, any one of those kind of terms, they all mean the same thing. You're making solid, strong contact to the middle of the field and you're using and utilizing both sides of the plate and both sides of the baseball field with authority. That's what Charlie's going to do for this team. And I hope to God that these guys aren't now so jaded from this, the way that this season has gone, that they're going to be close minded to the things that he says. And I hope that they take it into extreme consideration. And it's a f- more fun, if anything, last seven weeks. Yeah, you've got to have an open ears if you're a player when a guy like Charlie Manuel comes in. I mean, you have a guy who took them to five consecutive playoff appearances, took them to two consecutive World Series, won one of them. And the biggest thing for me is when Charlie was the manager here, the offense. Yes, they hit for a lot of power, but they were multidimensional. They could beat you a small ball, too. They could beat you by hitting the ball to the gap, pick, picking up doubles, picking up triples, you know. And they would they would draw a, a good amount of walks without, you know, really trying to draw walks. They would just, by chance, you know, Howard would come up, he would draw a walk. Utley, Burrell, those guys, they would draw walks. They would get on base, and then the guys behind them would, would knock them in. So... It wasn't, yes, they hit a lot of home runs. I think they set a franchise record for home runs in 2009, I think it was. Yeah. So they hit a lot of home runs, but they were a multi-dimensional offense that could beat teams in a lot of different ways. And I think that's that's why the players would need to open their ears to him when he's here, because they have the talent to be like that. They just they need to execute it. I agree. And we do have, we talked about it before this season started, we do have a bunch of different minded hitters it's not we don't have a a one through eight right now that's saying i think i can hit 25 home runs you know we have a super contact guy in gene segura we have a similarly based contact guy if he's swinging right in cesar hernandez this year has certainly not been the case um you know i saw something i think it was ryan spader i can't remember uh saying that he's essentially traded uh his walks of last year for weak contact this year um, which is obviously not great. Matt Winkleman, I think it was. Maybe maybe that's who it was. Doesn't matter. Um, yeah, but then you do have your traditional power guy in, in Reese Hoskins, who I think for the most part that's what we expect him to be. Um, we have our classic kind of hitter in JT Romuto. Um, you know, Scott Kingery kind of remains to be seen as to what his offensive identity is. But there's the point of this is is there's so many different guys one through eight right now and on the bench that have different minded philosophies that kind of blend together for the perfect balance that you look for in an offense. And this is not how the season should have went, you know, before or after the Andrew McCutcheon injury, you know, this is not how the season was supposed to go. No, not at all. Um, so do you have any final thoughts before we sign off on this one? My final thought is just I'm really excited to see what the offense can do under Charlie. It's because like I said, multidimensional when he was here. And I think that they have the right guys to do that. Um, you mentioned Reese being a pure power guy has been a huge disappointment in that regards. If you're a pure power guy, then you should be pushing, you know, 30, 35 home runs right now, not stuck on 22. Mm-hmm. But maybe Charlie can unlock that in him. Maybe Charlie can get him going. He gets on a power surge, you know, goes on a nice run where he hits five home runs over 10 games or something like that. gets himself going. So we'll see what this is all about here. So did the Phillies win? Are they going to get your viewership back? If I'm still holding to they need to go on a winning streak, <laughs> but with that being said, I am kind of, uh, I'll be away from the TV for the next week and a half, so I won't be able to watch until late August. I might be able to watch this weekend if they go on a winning streak. If they go on a winning yeah. streak. All right, so we still have one tentative fan right now. I'll tell you what, if, back on. if they win tonight, if they, if, they, if they sweep the Cubs, then I will watch this weekend. <laughs> I love the sweeping the Cubs. Um, so if you've, if you've even remotely enjoyed this one, we will have a debate piece, uh, out or debate piece, a debate podcast out between a and Y Pete, whose identity, even I don't know. He writes for us, uh, under an alias. He has submitted all of his work to us under an alias. I have no idea who this man or woman is. I assume it's a man given the name Pete, but again, it's 2019. So I may be offending someone between him and Andrew, Andy, AJ, Santangelo, Andrew, Andy, AJ, just give me a fucking name. Tell me what you want to go by. Everyone who sits there and says, eh, call me what you want. You're an ass. I love you, kid. I appreciate all the work. Give me a name. Just give me any name. Um, I go with Andrew. Andrew Santangelo since it sounds like a very professional name. It sounds like something you would hear on like WIP or something. All right, we're going to roll with Andrew then. Andrew, I took it out of your hands. We'll take more 
appropriately, Rob took it out of your hands. We're calling you Andrew Santangelo. But the two of them have written uh, differing sides of the Kapler argument. You have Pete, who says that he has run its, or that that has run its course and it's time to move on. And you have Andrew who says that Gabe Kapler is, while not perfect, certainly the least of the worries of the Philadelphia fan base and the organization as a whole. I will mediate that debate, and we will sit here and have a, a first take kind of feel on this one uh, as I sit here and pin the two of them against each other to give the listeners something uh, something fun to enjoy. So I am certainly looking forward to that. Uh, and then we also have uh, Sean New, I think. Uh, I can't remember now. We have so many writers on Capway Trust. Um, Sean New, I think, is doing the piece on... Uh, on the Mali firing and, and what it kind of means for, for Gabe Kapler, uh, similarly to that of what Corey Simon put out today, actually. So, um, but it'll, it'll be, uh, it'll be fun. It'll be an interesting week. We have a lot of articles coming out on our website. It's www.alwaysnextyearpodcast.com. You can always find, uh, our podcast and subscribe to our podcast on Apple iTunes, uh, Stitcher, Spreaker, Spotify, SoundCloud, iHeartRadio, I think has us now, Google Play, uh, pretty much wherever you listen to podcasts, we should be on. Be, uh, be a gem and leave us a review. Leave us something hilarious. Leave us something mean. Leave us something brilliant. Whatever you'd like. Just leave us the good reviews. Uh, eventually, as more decent reviews come in, we will, uh, review them on show and, and share with you guys some of the better ones. Uh, quick word from our sponsor over at Just Food, 215 794 Food. It's 215 794 3663. Treat yourself, take it home, visit our friend Asian Rob over there at Just Food. Have him and his team over there cater your home events, your wedding events, your school events, your any kind of events that you would like, or visit them in store in Buckingham Green Shopping Center in Bucks County, PA, just above Pellage Village. If you're familiar with the area, they have wonderful food, food that you can't pronounce, food that you can pronounce. They have things for a more refined palate and things for a more simpler palate. They have something for everyone there. They also have wonderful coffee, uh, which is the station in which they advertise us at. So go there, get coffee, pick up a business card, give it to someone at work, share the AMYP everything. Also pick a menu from Just Food. Just Food, 215-794-3663. That's 215-794-FOOD. Treat yourself, take it home. Rob, see you in three minutes for the next segment that we have to record. Let's do it. That son of a bitch again. He cracked open a rib or two. He beat me so they through and through. And so she over my unconscious frame. I won me healthy sheriff fights. Well, lucky son still happy life since Mickey Flynn beat me down and lame.